Good evening, everybody. I trust all of you are well and good today. Yes. Did you sleep well last night? Yes. Did you eat, did you eat well last night? Yes. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. So please turn to one another and greet them with Shabbat Shalom. Let's bow ahead for a word of prayer. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus, we come before your holy presence in the name of our dear Lord Jesus Christ by his precious blood this evening. Thank you, Holy Father, for receiving all this sacrifice of praise and worship and thanksgiving that your dear children offered unto you. Thank you for the presence of your holy angels Amen. who are in our midst dancing and lifting up their holy hands to worship the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for your glory, Lord, that came to abide in our midst. Because your word says, God dwells on the praises of his people. Now we ask you, Lord Jesus, to give us an understanding heart. Give us an understanding mind. Open our eyes. Open our ears. That we may hear what the Spirit of God will speak to the church in these last days. In the name of the blessed Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated everybody. Once again, a very good, blessed morning. I'm sorry. <laughs> that, is, that is too much of Dr. Bruce Allen. He always greets the congregation good morning. Whether it's morning, afternoon, or night, it's always a morning to him. So his anointing must have rubbed on me. Sorry about that. So once again, a blessed good evening to all of you. My message this evening is entitled, The Coming Glory of God. So this is a build up from last night. And we will climax it tomorrow. On one morning, on the 27th of May, 2023, so I was meditating the word of God, especially reading the book of Ezekiel in chapter 37. As I was deeply meditating that passage of scripture where the prophet Ezekiel was taken in the spirit to a valley of dry bones. And I'm sure you all know that passage of scripture, right? So as I was meditating on all the different facets of the different parts of the bones and how they all come together and the different process that the prophet Ezekiel was asked to do in order for the entire bones to come together as one body. And then they all, the, all the bones came together and stood up. How many people? How many people? Should be one person, isn't it? All the bones, right? Why do you all give me a stare? <laughs> this is not a trick question. Just a simple question. So if, now we all have different hundreds of bones in our body, right? So let's say we take, them, we take all the bones apart. And then by a miracle of God, all the bones come together. How many of you will stand up? One, one. one right? One Am I right, everybody? Yes. One. But there's a problem in this passage of scripture. Instead of one person, an army stands up. So an army, you all know by the term army, is not one person. It's many, right? 
So I was meditating on all this. How did one person become an army? As I was meditating, I heard the voice of the Lord Jesus say, come up to my mountain. And the next moment, I saw myself standing before the Lord Jesus in the spirit. And when I came and stood before the Lord, I also saw the saints Moses, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and also our dear brother Neville Johnson standing there. So as soon as I came and stood, so that will be the five of us together before the Lord Jesus, then the Lord said, come, let's go. So he led us to an open field, a wide, vast open field that was surrounded by mountains. So as we all stood there, looking at the lush green and the beauty of the place, I didn't notice those, the other four saints looking at the lush green. They may have already been used to seeing all that by now, but for me, it was a first experience. So as I was admiring the beauty in that place, suddenly a huge gigantic sun rose up from behind the mountains in full glory, just like on a midday sun. It arose and stood above us. It was literally many, many more times than the size of the sun in our solar system. And the sun was burning red orange in color. If you look at our natural sun, it will hurt your eyes. Am I right? Yes. But the sun in heaven, it doesn't hurt your eyes. Rather, the full weight of its glory will try to permeate into your very fiber veins and your whole body. And glory, fiery rays like waves of flash came forth from it. Have you seen the flash, fiery flash that come out from the sun? Yeah. Seen pictures of it? Yeah. So similar to that, this fiery flash came out from the sun and it swirled, swirled around the sun like the rings on the planet Saturn. It just swirl, 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 and it was beautiful, awesome, but at the same time, frightening to behold. It, it was sending fear, not a, a fear of like seeing a cockroach, you know? <laughs> not, not those kind of fear a cockroach or a mouse, whatever. This is the, that godly kind of an awe, awe, that kind of a fear, awe. And uh, this cloud of glory also pulsated with life. When you look at it, you can see that it breathes life, it breathes. And the cloud of glory was breathing with life and waves of the rays. As they were swirling around the sun, they began to increase in size and spread out from the sun all over the place where we were standing. Eventually, it enveloped us. And every one of us, the five of us, were now filled with this glory inside and outside. We were all reflecting the same glory that was on the sun. And not only that, we became like the sun, red, orange, full of flames of glory. We became like that. And when I looked at myself and I looked at uh, the other four saints, I was awestruck looking at the glory cloud filled sun. 
that it was an awesome awesome experience my description fails in comparison to what i had seen that day because no matter how much we try to explain it will be very difficult for you to comprehend it yeah. even if i use all beautiful english words to describe all of us unless we see will be we will be like those five blind men who saw an elephant you know the story you don't know the story poor thing okay tomorrow i'll tell you that story i don't want to break this flow by telling that elephant story today tomorrow okay if i forget please remind me and all struck by this i then turn and looked at the saint ezekiel and asked him a question is this how you all saw the glory of god in your days and every one of them nodded their head in affirmation and say yes this is how we saw the glory of god in our days the, the prophet moses saw it in his days ezekiel he saw it like that in his days and uh, then the lord jesus christ he drew me to him and placed his right hand on my left shoulder and placed his left hand behind my right shoulder and held me very tightly and he said these words you are to prepare my people for my glory now leave aside that sentence tell them about the coming glory prepare them this glory of god is coming it is coming and the church has been prepared all these years all these decades all these centuries even for the last two millennium they have been prepared for these times for the coming glory of god prepare them tell them it's coming they must put away sin filthiness and every detestable abomination from them abomination in our lives and the glory do not go hand in hand you must decide today which route you want to follow which path you want to choose the path of glory where you become a participator or walk away in your own fleshy filthy mundane christian lifestyle and stand far away and watch all the glory works that others will do like a spectator god puts two parts before you for this church as well as for the larger body of christ two parts what i experienced that day i was standing there as your representative just like we read in bible days a prophet is chosen as a sign and a wonder so god uses a prophet gives him an experience as a parable for him to communicate it to others that what he has experienced is available for everyone oh, amen. everyone yes amen why god chose me 
don't forget this symbol. All right, don't forget this. Just the grace of God. It's anyone. God can choose anyone. Seeing the glory and reflecting the glory and receiving the glory is available for every one of you. Every one of you. Those who are here and those who are afar. Everyone. Because this glory is going to come. But before that, you must put away sin. Number one. Filthiness. Number two, every detestable abomination from your lives. We don't need to define what they are. You know what they are. You don't need any prophet to come in this church or wherever you are, call you out by name and reveal all your sins. You don't need that because you know the abominations inside you. The good, the bad, the ugly. You know what is inside you. Am I right, everybody? You don't need any prophetic words. Your own conscience will either excuse you or condemn you. Because God's laws are written inside you. And that law will testify to you how we are. So put away all the abominations. Then the Lord said, there are more abominations in them, in their spirit, so and so, than upon them externally, on your body. In Mark chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, The Lord Jesus said, what goes inside does not defile the body, but what comes outside, comes from within. That defiles the body. Because that which is outside can be cleansed easily with all the modern soaps and detergents that we have today. You can cleanse it very easily. Whether you buy the cheap ones that you find in hotels or the most expensive ones. But how are you going to clean the abomination inside you? Even if you drink all the detergents, can you clean them? No. No, you you can clean inside. There's more abomination in your spirit and in your soul than they are in your flesh. So, get rid of them first. How to know what abominations there are inside you? Galatians chapter 5, verses 17 to 21. One simple test. Are you truly living the Christ life? Simple test. Are you truly living the Christ life? Every one of you can just do this simple test by yourself. You look at Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 to 21 and look at your heart. Use it as a mirror. You look at your heart and you can know whether you are living the Christ life or not. If you are always given to worrying to death. Christians are great champion warriors, you know. Right? Then you are not living the Christ life. Because the scripture says, do not worry. The Lord Jesus himself said, do not worry. Cast all your cares unto the Lord. Because he cares for you. So if you're not doing that and you end up worrying the whole day, then what kind of a Christ life are you living? 
So one abomination. If not an abomination, at least it stains your soul. And if you're prone to doubting all the time, you doubt this, you doubt that, you doubt this, you doubt that, unbelief is an abomination. Unbelief is an abomination. And that kept the Israelites from entering into the promised land. Abomination, unbelief. A controlling spirit is another abomination. A church leader can be a controlling person. A parent can be a controlling person over their children. About 40 years ago, I was ministering in a church. So there's this family, father, mother, elders in the church, and they have three lovely children, two boys and a girl. And when the children were born, the parents had dedicated them to serve the Lord. And as the children grew up, when they became teenagers, and they received the prophetic word that God was calling them to serve him. And the three children dedicated themselves to the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Now the father is a high school teacher. And in their country, they belong to the high class society. No? Though they are Christians. You know how they have this first uh, Baptist church, first Methodist church, have you ever seen a second Methodist church? <laughs> Every... <laughs> I always, you know, when I, when, whenever I see such churches, I will look for the second Baptist church or the second Presbyterian church. I never found any. That's always the first. Anyway. So they belong to such first church. And that church in their country is where all the elite in the society attends the church. So they are from that kind of a high society family. So being in the high society family, they wanted their children to have good, successful careers. Not serve the Lord. You can serve the Lord not in full-time ministry, whenever you are free. So, the parents discourage the children from serving the Lord full-time ministry and guided them to have successful careers. So the children trying to please the parents, they chose a path where they can have successful careers. So, they grew up, became young adults, and they all got married. Every one of them, the first boy got divorced, remarried, and got divorced. The second boy is living happily ever after so far. And this third girl, or the last child, got married, divorced. And all the three of them, their lives are totally messed up. Why? Because of walking away from the covenant, walking away from the, breaking the covenant that you make with God. You can earn tons of money in this world. But that cannot replace the call that God puts in your life. Yeah. See, look at uh, the prophet Moses for an example. In Hebrews chapter 11, it says that for the pursuit of God, he gave up all the riches in Egypt. Yeah. And he endured sufferings 
because he saw the invisible God by faith. So he gave up Egypt and he followed after the invisible God. Today, there are many Christians who start following the invisible God. Then, for some strange reason, Egypt pulls them. All the onions, the garlics in Egypt are more tasty than the tasteless manna. So they turn around and go back to Egypt. Not go back, they just go to Egypt. You may have all the comforts in Egypt. You may have all the riches in Egypt. May have all the pleasures in Egypt, but you have missed the crown. You have missed that glory where you could have been. Now you have missed, missed the high call. Look, so ponder what are the detestable abominations inside you. They can result in sickness on your body. Arthritis, cancer in the womb, cancer in the breast, can, prostate cancer, cervix cancer, stomach ulcers, are all the result, not of sicknesses, the result of sins. At least 90% of the time. Yes. I was once ministering in a, a Pentecostal church and a lady came up to me for prayer. She had cancer in the womb. And uh, while I was praying for her, the Lord told me, don't pray for her because it is not a sickness issue. It is a heart issue. She has unforgiveness in her heart. She has bitterness in her heart. Ask her to get rid of that and she'll be instantly healed. Amen. So I counsel her and made her check her own heart to see what are the issues in her heart. I said, you go and sit down quietly in a corner. You check your own heart. When you are done, come and see me. I'll pray for you again. And after 10 minutes, she came to me. As soon as I touched her, barely touched her forehead, she fell down to the ground. And when she stood up, totally healed. Amen. Nothing of my doing. It is that when sin is forgiven, when it leaves, the, the resultant of the sin leaves. It leaves. You may recall... Many times when the Lord Jesus healed people, He merely said, your sins are forgiven you. Right? right. That's right. And then He said, take up your bed and go. As soon as the sins are forgiven, the person is healed. Yes. Amen. So when this happened, it, it mystified me about the connection between the two. So I fasted and prayed for seven days to understand this mystery. So on the seventh day, the Lord Jesus appeared to me and he taught me what is the connection between emotions and sicknesses. And then he shared with me, the next time anyone comes to your meeting with breast cancer, womb-related cancer in a woman, and a prostate cancer, lungs-related problems in a man, don't pray for them. Ask them one question. If there is unforgiveness in their heart. If they say yes, then ask them to repent. So after that, I think that was in the year 1991. In the last 20 odd years, in the various nations that I've been to, I put this to the test. 9 out of 10% with such diseases will always say, yes, 
I have an unforgiveness problem. So, it confirmed what the Lord told me. Emotions connected to diseases. So why do you need to go through needless pain? Why? Why go through needless pain? When you can live a stress-free, disease-free, healthy lifestyle, simply walking in love. If you want to live a disease-free life, walk in love. Walk in love. Don't bear any grudges against anybody. Don't entertain any evil against anybody. Amen. Amen. Whether they are right or wrong, don't entertain in your heart. Just bless them. Bless their soul. They may be dumb and stupid in their head. <laughs> That's how Brother Kenneth Hagin used to say, no? Bless their soul, but their stupid, dumb brain. I have purpose in my own heart. There was a man of God in, who lived in India, one whom I highly admired, the very man of God in whose meeting I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. In the year 1985, his two kidneys failed and he needed a kidney transplantation. So uh, the medical facilities in India were not that great. So he has a very good friend, Pastor John Austin. Are you old enough to know him? Yes. Okay. Wonderful man of God. So he, Brother Austin, and this man of God are buddies. So when Brother Austin heard about that, he called him. He said, come to the US, and I will take care of all your medical bills, and I will make sure you get the best medical facility, and you get brand new kidneys. So Brother Denagran agreed, and the whole family came to Houston, Texas, and he went through the surgery, and he had uh, two brand new kidneys transplanted. A week later, his body rejected those kidneys. So now, after spending so much of money, after flying all the way from, to, from India to the US, he is now dying. In the past, he had his own kidneys that failed. Now he had a brand new kidney, and those kidneys are now rotting inside him. Now this is a man who walks with God and talks with God like Enoch and Moses. So his wife and his son, who was here in the month of June, they all were weeping and crying. Because medically, they know that the father will die in the US. They know that. So they all were weeping and crying. And the son tells in his testimony, he cried and he cried. He said, Lord, I don't let me bring my father's dead body back to India. Amen. He cried like that. And it was July the 1st. That was Brother Dinagran's birthday that day. And as they were crying and crying, bitterly crying, and they knelt down to pray. How to pray when you are broken hearted? Can you pray? No, you cannot. You can only cry in the presence of the Lord. And the glorious presence of the Lord filled them. And the Lord Jesus appeared before Brother Denagran. And he told him, today is your birthday. Today, one million people are praying for you, asking me to heal you and send you back to India. And then Brother Denagran asked the Lord, Lord, I have faithfully served you. Why did this come upon me? And the Lord looked at him and said, this came upon you because of your sin. And this Brother Denagran was shocked. He said, Lord, what do you mean? I have sinned. Then the Lord told him, 
through your ministry, hundreds and thousands of people are healed. Hundreds and thousands of people are blessed by your prayers. Instead of focusing on all those wondrous things that I've done through your ministry, you focus on those who criticize you. You meditate on those who speak despitefully about you. That opened the door for the devil to attack your kidneys. So your kidneys failed because of your sin. And when Brother Dinagran heard that, he knelt down and he humbly repented before the Lord. He said, Lord, please forgive me. And then the Lord laid his hands and touched him. And the two rotten kidneys were recreated and became brand new kidneys. And Brother Dinagran went on to live for another 30 years, serving the Lord till the year 2008. But the point is this, how did the sickness come about? Bitterness of heart. Bitterness of heart. When you meditate on evil report, how do you feel? You will feel distress. You will feel downcast. You will feel miserable. It opens the door for the enemy to attack you. These are abominations inside you. So tonight, you have to get rid of all these abominations. No matter how long it takes tonight. Today is Saturday, right? And I have a reputation for... Yesterday I made a big mistake, you know. I finished very early. <laughs> Listen, no matter how long it takes tonight, you are not going to leave the exit doors until the abominations are got rid of. Are we all agreed on this? Yes. Yes. You should not leave this place yes, Lord. without being cleansed. Without being purified, yes. without being sanctified. Unless and until you are cleansed, you can behold the glory but not become a reflector of the glory. Remember what I shared by vision last night that each one of you filled with the glory and it woozed out from you and it came out from you? You remember that? Yes. For that to take place inside you, you must be clean. The vessels that bear the things of God must be clean. Must be clean. The glory of God appears visibly like a thick cloud. So we are talking about glory of God. So how will the glory of God be seen? In the Old Testament days, it always appeared like a thick cloud. If you read Exodus chapter 24, verses 16 to 17, it says like this. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it six days. The Holy Spirit shows me something now. There is a woman here. You have bitterness in your spirit. And because of that bitterness in your spirit, it has corrupted your soul. And it has robbed the joy of the Lord from you. 
and you are on the verge of dying. So please get rid of that bitterness. No matter what it is, whether you are justified to feel bitter or not, it is destroying your soul and your walk with God. And all that God's plans for your life will be stolen away from you because of that. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. Now look at those two words there, cloud and consuming fire. This is what I just described seeing in heaven, a consuming fire and cloud. So the glory of God always appears like that, a thick cloud, sometimes flimsy cloud. It, it varies in degrees according to the cleanliness and the holiness in a church or in an individual's life. How receptive the congregation is. Are they all united together in oneness or are they not? Or are they disconnected? All this determines the density of the glory. Well, the thick or just flimsy light mist. It is very important when we gather together as a corporate body that everyone be united in oneness. You cannot be divided. In the year 1987, I was invited to do a three days meeting for a Lutheran church in a certain city in South India. And I stayed with the church, one of the church elders house. And it's always my custom to fast during the day and I will only eat after the meetings. So on the last day of the meeting, all the elders, they gathered together in one elder's house and um, to give me a word of thanks and then they give me an offering and before I was to leave, they said, please bless us. So there were about 10 elders, they all knelt down. And I started praying. As I started praying, I saw the Lord Jesus stand by my right side and he said, I'm going to show you about each and every one of their hearts. And you tell them exactly like how I will show you. I said, all right, Lord. And the Lord went and stood beside the first elder. And then he turned and looked at me, and he said, look at his heart. And of course, nothing bad came out of each person. So the first person, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Six persons were true. Now when he came to the seventh person, the Lord Jesus looked at me and he said, I am living. I said, Lord, what do you mean you are living? There's still another six person to go. And he said, I am no longer wanted in this place. So I'm living. And I pleaded with the Lord again. I said, Lord, you cannot go. How can you go? What about the other six person? And then the Lord pointed his finger at the elder beside whom he was standing. He said, he is thinking in his heart when you would finish praying so that he can go home to be with his wife and have his dinner. So the unity among them is now broken. Therefore, I am no longer wanted. And the Lord left. I was so mad, very mad. And of course, when the Lord has left, how can I go on prophesizing? There's nothing I can say after that. So I abruptly ended the prayer. 
and obviously, except that particular elder, the other five were gravely saddened, disappointed that I did not pray for them or give them a word. And I just told them, I'm sorry, I don't have anything. The Lord left. What made matters worse was, I was staying in that elder's house. I was so mad, very, very mad. Never had I been so mad like that day in my life before and after. So we sat in his scooter. You know what is a scooter? Yes. Okay. We drove to his house. I was very mad. I kept quiet all during the journey. Thank God it was only a short journey. We entered into the house. His wife opened the door. She said, oh, honey, what took you so long? Now that made me angrier. <laughs> so now, it's not only him, the wife is also a partner in this, like Ananias and Sapira. So I went into my room, changed my clothes, came out and sat at the dining table and that being my last night in their house, they had prepared a sumptuous meal. And uh, you know, in India, they serve you on a banana leaf instead of on a plate. It was a large banana leaf, wow. at least three feet in length. Wow. And from one end of the banana leaf to another end of the banana leaf, it was filled with food. And I was as hungry as a bear. <laughs> but at the same time, I was very mad, very mad. So I, I sat down, and again the wife told her husband, you know, what took you so long? I've been waiting and waiting. Now that further confirms what the Lord showed me. So then they asked me to say the grace for the food. So I closed my eyes. I just couldn't say grace. I looked at the man. I said, tell me one thing. When I was praying in that house, did you thought like this and like this and like this in your heart. He stared at me. He said, yes. And for the next 15 minutes, I scolded him. I said, all the sins of those five men will come upon your head. Wow. You and your household will bear the sin. And I will no more ever step into your house and I will never eat this filthy meal in your house. I got up and walked away, though I was hungry. <laughs> but the zeal of the Lord was more important than my fleshy food. Yes. I went into my room, closed the door, and thank God there was a jug of water. So I drank the water. And both the husband and wife, they came and they knocked on my door, asking for forgiveness. I did not open the door. The next morning, they made me a cup of tea and I refused to drink the water, tea. And before I left the house, I shook the dust off my feet. I said, I mean, the dust will judge you. See, that day, I learned one thing. In corporate prayer, very important for everyone to be united together. There should never be a break in the chain link. Very important. Very important. If you cannot continue in prayer, then get up and leave. Quietly leave. Do not be a stumbling block for the whole church or for the entire group to miss out the blessings from God. If you're praying individually, it doesn't matter. It's just you. People in Bible times always saw the glory of God in visible form. For example, let me give you five examples from the Bible. Number one, Exodus chapter 19 verse 16 says, all Israel, that's about 
3 million Israelites, at least a minimum of 3 million. There could be more. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Now please note the word a thick cloud. Secondly, Exodus chapter 40 verses 34 and 35. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle and Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now again, two words are mentioned together. Glory of the Lord and the cloud. Number three, First Kings chapter 8, verses 10 to 11. And it came to pass when the priests came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Again, we find these two words, glory of the Lord and cloud. Number four, Ezekiel chapter one verse four. Then I looked and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north, a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself and brightness was all around it and radiating out of its mist like the color of amber out of the mist of the fire. The glory that I saw in heaven is best described by this scripture. Number five, Acts chapter seven, verse 55. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So in all these five instances, four Old Testament references and one New Testament reference, the glory of God is always displayed visibly like a cloud, so that you can see. The glory of God is an intangible substance, just like holiness, love. You cannot see, but they can take a form. And the glory of God is formed in a physical manner like a cloud. So, who knows? One fine day, when all the saints in Shekinah are gathered together for worship, suddenly the cloud comes in. Do you believe it can happen? Yes. I tell you something. I don't believe it can happen. I believe it will happen. Yes. Not can. It will. Yes. Amen! 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 It will. It's, it's a definitive. Not an assumption. It's a definitive. Not only for this particular church, but also your individual lives. The glory cloud can even come in when you are all alone in your house worshipping the Lord. In 1991, when I first came to the U.S., I had to go to New York to minister among the Tibetan people there. And I stayed with a very wonderful black man in the city of Brooklyn. And he has a large house. He's an older, older gentleman who lived all by himself. So his church pastor uh, asked, requested him if I could stay with him. So he said, why not? Because he had a spare bedroom. So one day, he had gone out somewhere. And uh, before I left for the meeting, I ha there was about 15 minutes before I should go to catch the train to go from Brooklyn to Queens or to Manhattan. So I knelt down to pray. As I was praying, I felt an overwhelming desire to worship the Lord. He just came out spontaneously. So I knelt down, I lifted up my hands and I started worshipping the Lord. 
after 10 minutes of worship from the eastern part of the house I saw a cloud come in rolling into the house and it was a large house you know it was maybe like the length of the house was from that wall right up to this section so and I was kneeling down here at this place and I saw the cloud coming from there rolling in like waves and come all over me when it came all over me it bathed me and cleansed me and sanctified me just like how a real cloud when it passes you how do you feel that icy cold like feeling right have you experienced it yes. it was like that the only difference was instead of icy cold feeling I felt cleansed refreshed and renewed and it went on and on and on for a few minutes then after the Lord Jesus came so the cloud came to prepare me to receive this visitation from the Lord now where where did it happen in an apartment and I was all alone there so similarly it can happen to you all alone in your closet the glory cloud can come in Amen you believe is it possible can it happen or will happen Amen now the coming glory of God manifests in two ways number one the prophet Moses in Exodus chapter 33 verse 18 cried out like this oh Lord show me your glory and in answer to his prayer we read in Exodus chapter 33 verses 22 to 23 and chapter 34 verses 5 to 7 the Lord manifested his glory by displaying his nature so that is one aspect of the manifestation of the glory of God by the revelation of his nature now we will cover this more in depth tomorrow morning right now we'll focus on another aspect the second manifestation of the glory of God is in the demonstration of the power of God in John chapter 2 verse 11 we read after the Lord Jesus has turned water into wine this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him now look at this scripture the manifestation of God's glory is equated to a demonstration of the power of God in signs and wonders following the glory of God that's going to be revealed in these last days is more the manifestation of the mighty power of God yes. that's what we are going to see now right. Psalms 96 verses 2 to 3 a great awesome demonstration of the power of God and Isaiah chapter 30 verse 26 says it will be seven times greater than any glory ever manifested in the world since creation since creation whatever you read in the Bible about the great display of the glory of God is nothing compared to what is going to manifest in these last days in your midst seven times the glory Hallelujah. like the chief chief guest at the wedding in Cana said you have kept the best wine for the last so God has kept his best glory 
for the last, for the last days. Can you imagine something? How blessed you are to be born in such a time as this. How blessed. Sometimes, you know, we used to wonder like this. At least I have wondered like that. Oh Lord, how nice it will be if I had lived during the days of Moses. Then I would have gone around the wilderness for 40 years. <laughs> or we say like this, Lord, how nice it would have been if I had lived during your days and saw all your life. But you know, all the saints in the Old Testament and all the saints in the New Testament are saying how blessed you are for we, our eyes have not seen what your eyes are going to see. So you are more blessed. You are more blessed. You are more blessed and more privileged. Hallelujah! 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 Never in history, never in history, as a baby casted out demons. Wow. But in these last days, they are going to do that. Yeah. Never happened in history. Yeah. Reserved for these last days. Never. Wow. Never in history. A baby born. And when the first words he starts speaking, he will prophesy that Jesus Christ is coming soon. Yeah. Never happen. It will happen in these last days. I once dedicated a pastor's grandson. So his daughter was married for many years and she could not conceive. And she'll always ask me, uncle, please pray for me. That I'll be able to conceive. So I used to tell her, don't worry, my daughter. I will pray that you will conceive. So after about five years, she conceived. And she gave birth to a beautiful baby boy. They live in New York State. And... Um, so when, when, so she asked her father to request me to dedicate the baby since I had prayed for the baby to be born. So I dedicated the baby. So I took the baby in my hands. And as I took, the Lord told me, this is what you shall speak about this baby. So I prophesied about the baby, how he will grow up, how he will serve the Lord, and all that. And then the Lord told me, tell them, in case they don't believe all this, that God will give them a sign. When this boy starts speaking, the first words that will come out of his mouth is, Jesus Christ is coming soon. Wow. Tell them this will be a sign that all that you spoke today was spoken by the Almighty God. Amen. So, everybody was happy and they went back home. Sadly, the boy was dumb. For three years of his life, he never spoke. So the parents were shocked and saddened. How can a prophet's prophecy not come to pass and my son has become dumb? Couldn't speak. So they took him to all the best ENT doctors in the US, speech therapists, one after another. Nothing happened. So they're very, very saddened. And naturally, they asked their father to request me to pray for them. So I told them, don't worry. Don't worry. All will be well. He will speak in his good time. My, my second nephew, he did not speak for the first five years of his life. So my older sister always would cry that her son was born dumb. So I told, I used to encourage her, don't worry. And at the fifth year of his life, he started talking. And he's never stopped talking till today. <laughs> he talked too much. <laughs> so I, I told them this incident. I said, don't worry, some are slow starters. One day, now listen, one day, the mother bathed the three-year-old boy, placed him on the bed, 
and she went to the kitchen to make food for him suddenly she heard some noise coming from his bedroom she ran into the bedroom and saw the boy pointing his finger at the sky say mama jesus christ is coming again soon <laughs> the very first words he spoke jesus christ is coming again soon today the boy is 13 years old and he is a prophet unto the lord now who has heard of such things these are reserved for this last days even a newborn baby that is still sucking milk from the mother will prophesy and will cast out demons this is their destiny psalms chapter 8 verse 2 says that that is why the lord told me to prepare special tv programs for thoughtless for thoughtless from 0 age to 3 years old we design special programs that we telecast on angel tv to teach the little ones how to prophesy how to cast out demons in my natural mind it doesn't make any sense to me how this little ones are going to understand but that's not my problem right that's not my problem my problem or my assignment is to teach them is the holy spirit's problem to make them do wonders amen see these are the great awesome things that are going to take place in these last days so all those who are still single haven't got married and or those who are already married haven't have a baby yet how blessed are your wombs for you are going to give birth to a prophetic generation Amen. hallelujah 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 a prophetic generation will come forth from your womb that will shake the world upside down and put to flight the kingdom of satan that is the reason why there are laws enacted in your country to kill the babies so don't let me tell you one thing don't put up a black card and do protests before abortion clinics i show you a better way kneel down and pray come against those spirits the murderer spirits bind them once you bind them then the people are set free not to commit that evil act god is going to display seven times glory the best wine reserved for these last days what we have seen so far all the healing revivals all the miracles of the 60s 70s 80s are what the bible calls in joel chapter 2 verse 23 the first part the former rain former rain it says be glad then you children of zion and rejoice in the lord your god for he has given you the former rain moderately moderately all the signs and wonders that the men and women of god were used by god moderately the former rain which was a display of the nine gifts of the holy spirit first corinthians chapter 12 verses 8 to 10 but in the last days seven fold glory is going to manifest yes Joel chapter 2 verse 23 the second part says and he will cause the rain to come down for you the former rain and the latter rain together together, together. together. in the first month together. together so it's double fold rain double fold so the former rain plus the latter rain equals the manifestation of the seven spirits of god isaiah chapter 11 verse 2 the seven spirits of god carry a great 
greater demonstration of the power of God than the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. The nine gifts of the Holy Spirit are part of the seven spirits of God. So the last day's church will do works more than what the Lord Jesus did. John chapter 14 verse 12. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, now underline that, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than this will he do, because I go to the Father. So two kinds. One, the same works that the Lord Jesus did. Secondly, greater than what the Lord Jesus did. So, that brings us to a question. What were the works that the Lord Jesus did? What? Number one, he healed the sick. Matthew chapter 4 verse 23. Not just healed the sick, healed all manner of sicknesses and all manner of diseases. Everyone. Secondly, he cast out demons. Matthew chapter 4 verse 24. Third category. Performed miracles. Like, for example, multiplication of food. Now, you are going to do that in these last days because we will walk through times of trouble. Yes. Amen. Greater trouble. You cannot buy and sell without the mark of the beast. So how are we going to eat? You are going to supernaturally create food. Supernaturally. Manna will drop down from heaven like in the days of old. You will command food to come out from the ground. Tapioca, radish, carrots. <laughs> this is not funny. I have literally seen in visions what the last day's company will do. I saw a bunch of youths. They were walking in a field. Of course, hidden from the enemy. And they were hungry. So one young man, he pointed his finger at the ground and he commanded tapioca to come out. And suddenly from the ground, tapioca came out. And they took and they ate. And they point a finger at the river, fish, come. And the fish will jump up right into their laps without any fishing hook. Supernatural provision and multiplication. Multiplication of food. You will do the works that the Lord Jesus did. And the Lord Jesus walked on water. Now, he did not walk on the water because it was a shortcut. He walked on the water because he needed to go from point A to point B. Now, what is that? Supernatural transportation. Matthew chapter 14, verse 25. In the last days. Now, again, you cannot buy or sell without the mark of the beast. So how are you going to fly from point A to point B? Because you don't have the mark. No more passports. You need to show your hand or your forehead. You know, the US uh, border security, in the month of April when I came, so I gave my passport to the immigration officer, He looked at my passport, he scanned it, and then he gave it back to me. And then I went to Mozambique, and I came back from Mozambique, I had to come back to the US again, and I had some problem in uh, Qatar. Now what's the city of Qatar, Doha? Doha. So I had some problem there. So I told them I was coming from the US to Mozambique, and I'm returning back to the US. So he asked me, show me, when did you enter the US? So I flipped the pages. I couldn't find anywhere the entry stamp. I said, oh my God. 
Did I enter illegally? <laughs> no, I crossed through legally. So anyway, somehow, uh, after they were convinced, they let me board the plane and I came to the US. And again, the immigration officer did not stamp the passport. So I asked him this time, why are you not stamping on the passport? He oh, said, we, are, we have done away with that system. Whoa. Okay, now, so this time, when I came to the US, I observed very carefully what they were doing. So they scanned the passport, and then they asked you to stand before a camera. And the camera reads your entire face. Facial recognition technology. Facial recognition. Your retina are captured. Your whole face captured. And your fingerprints are all captured. So no more stamping of the passport. No more. Your face tells the officer when you came, when you left. Facial recognition. So this system will be upgraded with a chip on your forehead. How nice. I mean. Now listen everybody. As long as the chip is outside, it's okay to use it. Don't let it come inside you. That's the time to say no. No. Never. As long as it is outside, it's okay. We will use artificial intelligence, chatbot, GPT, ABCD, whatever. <laughs> I am all for technology, you know. I, I tell my staff, let's utilize technology. That's right. Because it helps you. Yeah, it right. cuts work and all that. But you should be the master of technology, not technology be your master. Don't let technology master you. So supernatural transportation. Acts chapter 8, verses 39 to 40. The evangelist Philip was asked by the Holy Spirit to go to the desert to preach to an Ethiopian Enoch. After he had done his work, the Holy Spirit carried him over the span of 28 miles. Supernaturally transported back to his next assignment. God will use you like that. Amen. 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 However, however, I've heard many ministers say like this. Oh, I'm so tired of flying. I wish Holy Spirit carries me like Philip transportation. Have you heard that? Never say like that. That's works of the flesh. <coughs> Holy Spirit will carry you on His assignment. You never use the Holy Spirit for your purpose. Amen. The Holy Spirit will use you. Not you use the Holy Spirit. Amen. See, this is the reason why we don't see such manifestations at this point of time because we are still very fleshy. Very fleshy. We are still bounded by flesh. Not submitting the flesh to the spirit. In absolute obedience. I once heard of this testimony. Which Dr. Bruce Allen shared with me. About a evangelist in Kenya. So he was a very prayerful man, very godly man of God. One day as he was praying, the Lord told him, pack your bags and get ready to go to a place that I will tell you. So this man of God, in obedience to the Lord, packed his suitcase with all the necessary clothes and he was ready. So as days passed by, as he was praying one day, the Lord told him, okay, now get your bags ready and go to the airport. So he had no money, and the Lord told him to go to the United Kingdom. No money, no passport, or oh, no, no, he already had a passport. No visa, 
nothing. So he thought in his heart, when he goes to the airport, he'll be met by someone with a visa, with all the money and all that. So he came to Kenya International Airport in Nairobi. So he stood at the entrance and looking around to the left and to the right for someone to come up to him and say, excuse me, sir, this is yours. I used to do that, you know. And uh, so when I read the story, I could clearly identify myself with that character. So he, after waiting for a long time, he found no one. So he asked the Lord, Lord, what shall I do now? The Lord told him, go inside the airport. So he thought, okay, now inside the airport, someone will be there. So he got inside the airport and no one came. So the Lord told him, go into the men's room. So he went to the men's room and the Lord told him to go to a particular cubicle. He said, go inside the cubicle. So he entered into the cubicle. The Lord told him now, lift up your hands and worship me. Have you ever done that? Inside the public cubicle? No, you are lying. <laughs> if you ever said you have done that, you are a liar. <laughs> so he lifted up his hands at the top of his voice. He started worshipping the Lord. He closed his eyes and he worshipped. For how long, I do not know. After some time, the Lord told him, okay, that's enough. Now go out. When he came out, he was at Heathrow International Airport in London. In just one split second, translated from translated. Nairobi to London. So now when he came out of the airport, he looked at all the white faces. <laughs> he was the only black man there. And when he looked at the signboard, he says, Welcome to London. So he was shocked. And then the Lord told him, okay, go out. So he went out hoping that a limousine will be waiting for him. <laughs> and sure enough, the, he had to minister for someone. He ministered. After ministering, the Lord told him, now go back to the restroom. <laughs> so he went back to the restroom. Same thing. He worshipped the Lord. After some time, he opened his eyes and he was back in Nairobi. Yeah. And this is a simple-minded evangelist who never boasted how God used him. He never boasted. All his attitude was to be obedient to what the Lord tells him to do. It is such vessel who have died to self that God uses. Because you have died to self. You're not going to write a book and publish your story, and make millions of dollars. Today it has become a laughing stock, you know. A small little vision you see, you appear on a national television. And you become a celebrity. Or you cook up some lies about seeing heaven. You know one little boy who's, who became famous overnight, and then it turned out to be a fraud for all lies. By then, his father had made millions of dollars. See, now you tell me, if another person with that genuine experience, now who will believe him? Nobody will believe that because one was proven a lie, how can another one be true? True saints don't boast. That is a true saint. The mark of true sainthood the mark of a genuine experience with God, they don't boast. Thank you, Lord. They don't boast. I read in one of Brother Kenneth Hagin's book, his first experience of seeing the glory of God, he never told anybody that experience for 25 years until the Lord told him, now share it. For 25 years, he kept it to himself. No boasting. A genuine experience of God. The fourth thing that the Lord Jesus did, he walked through the midst of people invisibly. Luke chapter 4, 
verses 28 to 30, John chapter 8, verse 59. Now, this kind of supernatural protection will be very useful for the last day's remnant yes. in the midst of opposition and hostility. You become invisible. The last day's remnant will do all these works and greater. Greater. Now I want to show you something. Please turn your Bibles with me to Isaiah chapter 60 verse 1. Those of you who don't have a physical good old Bible, turn your digital Bible. Isaiah chapter 60 and the verse 1. I'm going to show you a prophetic perspective of this scripture. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Now, if you look at this simple scripture, there are a few key words. One, arise. Two, shine. Three, glory of the Lord. Four, reason upon you. Four key words in this scripture. Now if you put this together, what it means is, when the glory of the Lord rises upon you, you will shine. This is similar to my experience in heaven. When the glory of the Lord rose and shine upon me, we reflected it. We shine. The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Now, when the glory of the Lord rises upon you, you will shine. But, before that can happen, there is a very important word we should not overlook. And that is the word arise. First, you must arise. If you don't arise, then the glory of the Lord cannot rise and shine upon you. Why should we arise? Ephesians chapter 5 verse 14 says, Therefore he says, Awake you who sleep. Arise from the dead. And Christ will give you light. See, two kind of rising. One, sleeping. People sleep in the church, don't they? So, number one, people sleep in the church. They are sleeping. Number two, dead. Am I right, everybody? Yes. So, there are two kinds, two groups of people in the church. One group sleeps. Another group, dead. So, the mercy of God is calling you now, Arise! Amen. Arise! When the Lord Jesus Christ came to Jairus' house, his 12-year-old daughter was dead. What did he tell her? Arise. Right? Yes. The girl was dead. The Lord said, arise. And when a person is sleeping, you tap and you wake them up. What do you say? Arise. Same word for two kinds of people. Those who are sleeping, those who are dead. So before the glory of God can rise upon you and shine on you, you must rise. Arise. You cannot be sleeping anymore. You cannot be dead anymore. The dead will be given an opportunity to be raised. And if they don't want to be raised, they will be cremated. Am I right? Yes. The scripture says, the dead cannot be found among the living. Right? Yes. When you are alive, you stay in your house for 50 years, 60 years, up to 70, 80 years. The moment a person dies, the very next day they are buried. Yes. Right? Yes. I've always wondered this, you know. 
Why they don't keep the dead forever? Let them stay on in their house where they have grown up. Sometimes I do some philosophical exercises, you know. I just ponder all these issues. Then I come to some conclusion. The dead cannot remain among the living. If you are dead, you will be given an opportunity to arise. If you don't want to arise, you want to remain dead, then you'll be kicked out. Kicked out. Some years ago, the Lord told me, I'm going to prune your ministry. I'm going to prune, I'm going to cut away all the branches that are not bearing fruit so that your ministry as a whole tree will bring forth more fruit. So I said, all right, Lord. And the pruning process started. Pruning process started and several of my key staffs, they left. And these are not just uh, newcomer staffs, long-term staffs. And the Lord told me how they will live. Opportunity will be given for them to arise and to make a new, to be replanted and to position themselves in sunlight and to receive water. If they don't, they continue to decay and die, then they'll have to be removed. How it will happen? Circumstances will happen in their lives where they themselves will tender in their resignation. I don't have to kick out anyone. And in the last seven years, I've seen that happening over and over again. Earlier on, Pastor Sweet mentioned that we are building a new headquarters. For 18 long years, we survived in a small little office complex, half the size of this church and we outgrew it too much until we were breaking out on the seams everywhere and yet there was nothing we could do we had no money to purchase a land and all that and then when finally the Lord told us okay now the time has come to buy a piece of land and build Shakaina church help us a lot and in the year 2020 we purchased eight and a half acres of land and we started constructing the land and Pastor Sweet was present with us for the groundbreaking ceremony just one day before there was a total international lockdown yeah. and Pastor Sweet just made it on time yeah. if not you would have been with us for two years yeah. <laughs> just, just at the nick of the time he escaped Now, here's the thing. When we were raising funds for the building project, the word of the Lord once came to me. He said, all those who will not consecrate themselves as Levites will never enter into the new building complex. And ever since I received that word, till three days ago, Several of my key staffs have left. And the last one left just three days ago. And he was with us for 16 years. Why? A circumstance came, happened in his life. He had to tender his resignation. But if you look at his life, it was an unfruitful life. Unfruitful. Levites must be committed and consecrated. If you don't have that kind of a consecration, then you cannot be a Levite. Same is true for this church. Those who will not bear fruit, you'll be cut and thrown out. 
something will happen in your life that you yourself will leave this church. Either a change of job. You have to move to another state. And you come and tell Pastor Sweet, Pastor Sweet, I'm sorry. I'm sure you won't feel sorry, no? <laughs> this is the Lord's doing. Yes. Those who need to be planted will move here. Those who need to be removed, they will be removed. Until this entire tree is a pure tree. A pure tree. No one can thwart the purposes of God that he has determined before the foundation of the world. That in this place, it should become an oasis for the healing love of God to flow forth. This was ordained before the foundation of the world. Before. Then God picked a man called Joseph Sweet. From Palm Springs, sent him to Lancaster. Of all the places in the world. Why Lancaster? (laughs) Desert, right? Doesn't even rain. (laughs) A few days ago, one of the church members, Eric, came to our place to do some repairs for our place. And the clouds became dark. So I told Eric, it's going to rain. Let's go inside the house. And after we went into the house, no rain came. (laughs) Except just four drops of (laughs) water. This is true, scouts on him. I counted the number of drops that fell on the ground. (laughs) Just, Just only four drops. Desert. Desert. But in this desert, there will be an oasis. Hallelujah. 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 An oasis of God's love. Not just love, healing love. A healing stream that will flow forth and the nations will come here to drink the water of it. Amen. So the glory of the Lord will first fill your spirit. Then it will pierce through your flesh to shine forth. First it must enter inside you. In order to enter inside you, your vessel must be clean. That is why you need to put away all the abomination from you. Sanctify your spirit, soul and body. It comes inside you. Then it will penetrate. When it becomes too overflowing, it will penetrate penetrate through your skin and shine forth. I'll give you two examples. Exodus chapter 34 verse 29. The face of the prophet Moses shone. People literally saw his face shining with glory. Secondly, Matthew chapter 17 verse 2. The Lord Jesus Christ transfigured. From within, the glory shone through his skin. So two examples in the Bible. Two testimonies. So you too can experience this. Now when will the glory rise upon us? When? We talked about all the glory. Now the next question is, when will this happen? Isaiah chapter 60 verse 2. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. Arise over you and upon you. When? During a period of darkness. How dark? The Lord Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verses 37 to 39, that in the last days will be like the days of Noah. Now, how were the days of Noah? Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 says, the days of Noah were gross darkness. There was gross wickedness. 
gross immorality, corruption, violence, and every imagination of the mind is full of wickedness. Now, if you look at today's society, you, f- you will find that we are not too far from that. Right? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 8 says, Perilous times will come upon in the last days. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Worse than the days of Noah. So this is the first sign. Before the glory of the Lord will arise, there will be a period of darkness. Secondly, Zion must be built up. Psalms 102 verse 16. For the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. So Zion must be built up first. So that brings us to a question, who or what is Zion? Zion is two. One, the church. Secondly, you as an individual. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 13 and 16. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So Zion must be built up. Example, Shekinah Worship Center, Zion. This Zion must be built up first before the glory of God can come in. How will Zion be built up? Now don't forget these two scriptures. Ephesians 4, 13 and 16. Till we all come to the unity of faith. So every member in Shekinah must be united in faith. No differing faith. All united together in faith. Secondly, growing in the knowledge of the Son of God. Thirdly, you are growing to become a perfect man. And the full stature of the fullness of Christ. Number five, the whole body must be joined and knit together. Every joint supplies, meaning every member in the church does some work of ministry. Everybody is important. No one is useless. The weakest person to the strongest person. Everybody is useful for the work of the ministry. Whatever, small work, big work, everyone has a call. Everyone has a call. Whether you are young or old, whether you are free or born, whether you are in good health or bad health, whether you are strong or feeble, doesn't matter. Everyone must supply. You cannot say, I have no time. You cannot say, I am busy. Together. Growing together in the unity of faith. An excellent test of the health condition of any church is midday prayer meeting. Attendance. That, that, stays, that shows the life vitality of the church, not a Sunday attendance. Sunday attendance, you show your face to mark attendance. When you come together, 
You bend your knees to take hold of the horns of God. That is the purpose of the church. A house of prayer. Right? Not a house of preaching. The scriptures doesn't say that, right? When the Lord Jesus cleansed the temple, and when he entered into the cleansed temple, his first words were, my house shall be called a house of prayer. When he established that, after that, he taught the people and he healed the sick. So first... The church should be established as a house of prayer. Which means every believer must be a praying person. Every believer must be a praying person. In the year 1990, I went to Tibet. So I crossed Tibet from China. From Hong Kong, I went into China. Then went to a city called Chengdu. From Chengdu, took a long bus ride for 12 hours to the eastern part of Tibet. So while I was walking on the mountains in Tibet, I came across a couple, a British couple. They were about maybe in their 50s. And, uh, and they were all carrying backpack. But when I looked at the woman, her backpack was a different kind of a backpack. Her husband had a backpack. But her backpack was her newborn baby. Eight months old baby, she carried on the high plateau mountains in Tibet. So I was shocked. How did you bring a baby to such high altitude? So I asked her, you know, what made you uh, come to this place with your baby? You know what she said? As for me and our household, we will serve the Lord. So, the point is this. If that woman can bring her newborn baby to serve the Lord in a high altitude mountain, why can't you bring your babies to a prayer meeting? Why can't you do that? Why do you say, I have to stay at home to look after my baby? Put your baby in the presence of the Lord. And the angels will entertain them. You know, my nephew is there. Stand up. This is my nephew, David. From day one, my mother cared for him. So I've been looking at him from day one. Today he's 30 years old. Today mean not today. <laughs> Next month, he'll be 30 years old. So for 30 years of his life, I've been watching him from day one. So when he was a newborn baby, he was lying on the crib. And one day, I came close to the, you know, whenever I come back from the office, I would just go and play with this little boy. And one day, I stood at the entrance to the my mother's room where his script was and he was just wriggling his hands shaking his legs and just smiling and smiling and smiling so I wondered what was this boy up to <laughs> so I went out you know and the next day I saw him doing the same thing then the third day when this happened again I prayed I said, Lord, what is happening? And the Lord opened my spiritual eyes and I saw an angel playing with him. <laughs> tickling his toes. <laughs> and just, you know, tickling his armpits and just playing with him. See, the scripture says, you know, the day when you're born, your angels are appointed to look after you. Yes. Right? Yes. That day I saw with my own eyes how angels look after babies. So bring your babies and put them right here. Is it okay, Pastor Sweet? <laughs> See, I'm not the boss, you know, he's the boss. I can just make a prophetic statement, but then I must turn back to my flesh and ask the boss permission. So bring your babies, put them here. The angels of God will take care of them. Hallelujah. And you just worship the Lord. 
and the spirit of the Lord will come upon the little ones and they will all lift up their hands and they will worship the Lord. Why do you segregate them to a children's club? Wrong. We should change that principle. Put them right in the presence of God where the glory comes. If this is the chosen place where the golden bowl is, why should they be somewhere else? Shouldn't the children come and drink from the golden bowl? Yes. Shouldn't they? Yes. Wow. When Solomon dedicated his temple, the Lord told him, I have put my name in this place. Everyone who comes to this place and prays, my eyes will be upon them and my ears will be attentive to their prayer. So there are some places that God chose us. He chooses the place. And there remains a special grace. Special grace. In that chosen place. So then you want to gather there. You don't want to be found anywhere else. That's the chosen place. Years ago. When Brother Neville and I would go around ministering in many cities in the U.S., after some years, the Lord told us, we were in St. Louis, speaking at the church conference. The Lord told us, from now onwards, don't go anywhere else, but only do conferences in Lancaster. Why? This is my chosen place. Wow. And I will gather the remnant here, where I will teach them. So from, the Lord spoke to me, and the Lord spoke to Neville simultaneously. So after the meeting, when we... When I shared that with him, he said, he too received the same word. So from that year, we stopped attending any other conferences. We only came to Shekinah. All the, from that year till this year. So this is the chosen place. So you are blessed and privileged. Yes. If this is the chosen place where God's going to display all his glory, then you want to be in the place where the action is strong yes. and powerful. Yes. So Zion must be built up. Then the glory of the Lord will come to cover the whole earth. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 14. When that happens, then another thing will happen. Then Gentiles, unbelievers will come to your light. Isaiah chapter 60, verses 3 to 5. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant. And your heart shall swell with joy because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. Right. Amen. What does this show? A great harvest of souls. Amen. Great harvest great. of souls. Gentiles will start flocking. They will. they will all come here to taste and see how good God is. Because the streams of living water are flowing here. That's right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The streams of living waters Hallelujah. are flowing here. All will come. The lame, the blind, the deaf, the yes. dumb. Yes. Everyone who needs something That's right. will come. Yes. Will come because the Lord Jesus will be present here. Yes. The glory of the Lord abides here. Like bees that are attracted to a colorful flower. All the Gentiles from the east, from the west, from the north to the south will all gather in this place. The last day's great harvest. Now, besides signs and wonders and miracles, the coming glory of God also includes the ministry of angels and saints. So we should not 
push them aside. They are part of the kingdom of God. So we want to be open to the ministry of angels and the ministry of the saints of God. The Old Testament and the New Testament are full of angelic ministry. So we don't need to go into great depths looking at that. But there are fewer references in the Old Testament and New Testament regarding the ministry of saints. Daniel chapter 4, verse 13, verse 17. You read about the watchers who come down from heaven to minister, bring a word to the prophet Daniel. Daniel chapter 8, verse 13. Two saints from heaven will come and talk with the prophet Daniel and give him some instructions. And the two saints will talk among themselves and the prophet Daniel was in their company and heard their conversation and knew what they were discussing about the plans of God concerning the destiny of Israel. Matthew chapter 17 verse 3, Mark chapter 9 verse 4, Luke chapter 9 verse 30 and 31. The Lord Jesus himself had the ministry of the saints when the prophets Moses and Elijah appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration and they spoke with him. They discussed with him. They explained to him about the sufferings that he was going to accomplish in Jerusalem. They shared with him communion of the saints. You don't want to push that aside. Now let me share with you a true incident that happened some years ago in Yorkshire, United Kingdom. A group of ministers in Yorkshire wanted to meet with God and study the book of Ezekiel. So they rented a cottage in a uh, outskirts of the country where there are no buildings anywhere nearby. So there was only one cottage, so they were away from all crowd. And they studied the book of Ezekiel day after day. Every day they'll gather, they study, they meditated. <coughs> one day, as they were studying, there was a knock on the door. And when they opened the door, there stood a man. And the man very courteously asked them what they were doing. So one of the ministers who opened the door said, Well, we are gathered here, just a few of us. We are praying, we are seeking the face of God, and we are studying the book of Ezekiel. So the man very courteously asked, May I come in? So they said, Well, of course, please come in. And he got and he sat among the men of God and he took a Bible and masterfully expounded on the book of Ezekiel. And when he was done, he stood up, thanked them for the courtesy and took leave of them. When the doors were closed, suddenly the ministers realized something. Oh, we made a mistake. See, the English people are very polite. When a guest comes, they offer them a cup of tea, you know. So they say, oh, we miss giving that man a cup of tea. Let's call him, invite him back and offer him a cup of tea. Now, from the time the man left and from the time they realized, just a minute or two had passed. When they opened the door, there was no one. And it is impossible for within a minute for this man to walk, to disappear anywhere. So who was that man? A saint from God. A saint sent by God to come and teach them the Bible. This has been my experience from the year 1984 till now. On January 7, I think, 1984, I was on a 40-day fast. And on that particular day, I think that was the seventh day of the fast. So from nine o'clock in the morning, I was worshiping the Lord, waiting on God, praying in tongues. And on the last hour of the day, I said to read the scriptures. 
Suddenly, I heard the sound of someone opening the door. And I turned around to see who a saint walked in. And he was a very glorious person to look at. And I was just waiting on the Lord. He came and sat beside me. And he said, turn your Bible to the book of Revelation. And I turned the Bible to the book of Revelation. And he went on verse by verse, the book of Revelation. And I was very curious who this man was. And his face was so glorious to behold. He looked very aged, with a long hair, with a long beard, and a scar on his left brow. And when we were through with chapter 1, I plucked up a little courage to ask him, Sir, who are you? He just smiled at me and said, I'm the one who wrote this book. I was just... <sighs> that was my first experience. From that day, every other day, the Apostle John would come and taught me the book of Revelation. And even during the lockdown, I was asked to do a study on the book of Revelation, an online course. And two weeks before that, the Lord told me, I want you to read the book of Revelation seven times in the span of seven days. So every day when I was reading the book, the same John will come and taught me. That was how I was able to teach. Even today, every day, this has been my experience. Why? So that I can share this with you about the reality of the ministry of the saints. So that when they come to you, you will know that you are not imagining. It's not your imagination. You're not imagining something, but it's real. So in conclusion, the power of God, which I mentioned earlier to you, it will be a sevenfold glory that will manifest in these last days. And that sevenfold glory is called the powers of the age to come. You find this in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 5. In the year 2008, Brother Neville and I were invited to speak at a conference in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Do you know who is Paul Keith Davis? Yes. He was also the third speaker. So one afternoon, I was praying and waiting on God concerning what I should speak at this conference. And four angels visited me. One among the four was the captain. And he said, I am the prince of Louisiana, the chief prince angel over the state of Louisiana. When Hurricane Katrina came, do you all remember that? Yes. Are you old enough to remember that? Yes. He said, we oversaw the destruction of this state. And after that he said, God wants you to share in this conference on the powers of the age to come. So of course I've never uh, heard anywhere else about this subject, powers of the age to come, except those words in the Bible. So for the next two hours, they taught me on what are the powers of the age to come that will manifest in these last days. After teaching, they said this. This is the awesome, mighty power of God hidden since creation. Even the angels in heaven have not seen that power of the Holy Spirit in demonstration yet. That really blew my mind. Can you, if you look at the starry sky, all the billions of stars and all the millions of galaxies, so beautiful in wonder, and all came into existence by one word that God spoke. How great must be His power? And yet this angel says, 
that is nothing. That is nothing compared to what is going to come in the last days. Now it is reserved. That power and the demonstration of the Holy Spirit is reserved for these last days. The powers displayed during creation pales in comparison to what God is going to do in these last days. The world has seen the power of the Holy Spirit as a rushing wind, but it has not seen him as a tempest. A storm that is gathered from the four corners of heaven and they will come together as a perfect storm. The four winds of the Holy Spirit from the four corners of heaven will be gathered together as one great perfect storm to blow on the face of the earth in these last days. And it will begin here. How blessed you are. How blessed you are. You will get to eat the first fruit. The first fruit. Not only eat, but also be a partner with the Holy Spirit. Partner. Working together with Him. Just like how the 12 disciples work together with the Lord Jesus to carry out his great commission all over the world. You will be his ambassador. How blessed you are. How blessed. What more can you ask? For such a time as this. You are so blessed to be born and be planted here and to be associated with these ministries. So, going back to the beginning before we close this meeting. The glory of God is going to come. But they must First, put away sin, filthiness, and every detestable abomination from them. Sin, filthiness, detestable abomination in your spirit, soul, and body. Let's all kneel down before the presence of the Lord. I want you to probe deep into your heart and look for the detestable abomination inside you. What there may be, are there any, anything that is abominable, that is preventing you from entering into the fullness of God? There are so many places down here. If you want to come to the front to kneel down or prostrate, you are welcome to do so. You don't have to be cooked up to the little corner wherever you are. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you. Ask the Holy Spirit to probe deep inside you. Those two camera women, I will stand straight, still here. You get down on your knees. Don't worry about the camera, okay? I will, I will stand st here, still. Examine your heart. Examine. I see a very gigantic eye of the Lord in our midst. And the eye is penetrating deep into 
each and every one of your hearts. Even those who are watching online, please get up from your chairs, from your sofas, from your beds, and kneel down now. Prostrate if you like. Now you probe inside you. Probe inside. Are you lazy in the spirit? Are you not fervent? Have you lost your first love? Have you lost your zeal for the Lord? Are you no more hungering and thirsting like how you used to in days gone by? When you pursued after the Lord with such fervor, with such a zeal, you are willing to burn the midnight oil and wait in the presence of the Lord. You are willing to forgo your sleep and you waited on the Lord in the early morning hours. Where is the zeal now? Have you allowed the flesh of this world, the lusts of this world to corrupt your soul? <coughs> then ask the Holy Spirit to cleanse you. First, you must take them out of you. Every unchrist like attitude, abomination, bitterness, anger, unforgiveness, Get them out. Get them out. Pride. Arrogance. Stubbornness. Get it out of you. Renounce them. The word stubbornness comes and stands before me. Is it inside you? Stubbornness in the flesh, stubbornness in your soul. Get rid of that. Humble yourselves. Stubbornness in insisting your own way and not wanting to be a follower, but insisting on be a leader when the call is not there for you to be a leader. Your call is to be a team player, but you want to be a leader. Pride, stubbornness, get rid of it right now. Cast that out of you right now. Have you stopped drinking from the cistern of living water? Why have you stopped drinking? You are now dry and thirsty. And you do not know that you are dry and thirsty because you have stopped drinking from the living waters. And you try to satisfy yourself with wrong water, wrong wine. And that only makes you more thirsty. Why have you stopped eating the living bread? Once upon a time, you not only ate the living bread, but 
you also add the deep meat. Now you are eating stale food. Why have you stopped? Why have your hands become withered? The hands that were quick to do the works of God. Your, your hands were used by God to lay on the sick, to heal the sick. Now your hands have become withered. You have withheld your hand from doing the works of God. Why? Repent. Repent. Why have your mouth become frostbitten? I see someone here. Your mouth is sewn with a black thread. You're not able to open your mouth. The very mouth that sang for the praises of God, that spoke of the glory of God, that testified of God, now it is tight lipped and sown. Repent. 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 Unless you repent, the curse will remain. The sickness will remain. Your joyless life will remain. And the peace that departed from you will not return. Repent now. Repent. I see the blessed Lord Jesus come walking in your midst and he tells me I have come to seek my loss I have among them my choice sheep that used to follow me everywhere where I went but now they are lost. Are you that sheep? And the Lord Jesus says, I'm looking for my spokesman. There is a daughter of mine who used to testify of me. She used to point people to me. But now, she has turned her back to me. Where is she? There is a person here, you have a call for to do children's ministry, but you have failed to do that work, and you have backslided in your call, and just simply doing nothing now, the Lord Jesus is calling you, my dear sister, to turn back. Turn back. Your life is dry. Your life is barren. Your life is fruitless because you have walked away from the call that God gave you. In your younger days, you loved children. You would carry them in your hands and love them as if they are born out of your own womb. And you nurtured them. You taught them Sunday school lessons. Now, you have forgotten them all. 
So return back. Return back. There are several youths here. The Lord Jesus shows you have stopped following the Lord Jesus. You used to follow the Lord with all your heart. You used to be the first in the church. But now you have allowed the cares of the world to overtake you and you have forgotten your call. My dearly beloved youths, turn back. Turn back to the Lord. The Lord Jesus says, Pastor Sweet, Behold, I lay here as a chief cornerstone, and upon this rock you shall build my church. And I shall raise up for me a company of people who will be strong and mighty, mighty to do exploits for their God. They shall be like the fearless men of David, the mighty men of David, who had faces like lions, who were strong and mighty in both their hands, to shoot arrows and to throw a sling. For I shall raise up for me a mighty army, mighty and strong in this place. And you, my servant, shall shepherd them and shall lead them. For in you I have found a man after my own heart. Amen. Be faithful and true till the end. For the end of all things is coming soon. Again I say unto you, be faithful and true. You have kept your heart pure, humble, and small all these days, which is a delight before me. Continue, my dear son, to bear these fruits of righteousness in your life. For I will soon adorn you with my gifts. I will put on you bangles on your hands, a nose ring on you, and a earring on you, and tinklets on your feet, so that you will be a delight, a daughter of the king, a delight to the king. Prepare me a place that I may dwell here. Take hold of the feet of the Lord, my dearly beloved brothers and sisters, sons and daughters. Take hold of the feet of the Lord. Don't let it go until you are made clean, until you are cleansed. I feel in my spirit, and I know in my spirit, some of you are already experiencing a cleansing taking place deep inside you. You feel a churning in your spirit, something that has been churned inside your spirit, like a hand put inside your spirit and turned in every other way. You are feeling that. 
that is the hand of the lord that is turning things around inside you and taking out the abominations so let go let go don't hold on to the things that you think are dear to you even your dreams your ambitions let it go your desires let it go say lord not as i will but thine will be done say like how anna said lord if you will bless me with a son i will give him to you i will give it to you lord the child shall not be an idol to me but i will give it to you lord that he may be your prophet can you say that thank you wonderful lord jesus thank you wonderful lord jesus let go let go let go let go when you are willing to die you shall live in death there is life Please lift up your holy hands. Lord Jesus, I commit each and every one of them who are here and who are afar. All those who have united themselves in this meeting. You have heard their cries. You have seen their tears. You have seen them tearing themselves apart. and as best as they know to remove the detestable abominations from within them to surrender to let go and to die to self they have done to the best of their ability lord and now i pray spirit of the living god you who searches all the deep things in the heart and in the spirit of all men i pray even as they go back to their homes you'll continue to probe deep inside them until they offer themselves as a living sacrifice so that they can offer an offering in righteousness and push them push them holy spirit yes. refine them burn inside them until all shaft yes. a burn yes. all the dross is burn 
and nothing remains because your word tells us when we die then we shall live so i pray now lord bring your sons and your daughters through death that they may live and they may arise so that your glory may rise upon them thank you my father and watch over them lord all throughout this night in the name of the blessed lord jesus christ we pray amen, amen. please be seated everybody thank you holy holy holy